<laughs> anyway, someone said that to me again, and I said, look, if anyone says to me the word abortion, I will not come back. I don't want to hear it. And I was just really mad. I said, I don't want to hear it. No one better speak to me about it. I'll just hang up. I refuse to speak to me, and I will not cooperate. I said, otherwise, I will. Who were these people talking to you? There was, um, uh, oh, God, what's his name? It's, um, <laughs> I forgot his name. He was, he was a very high up executive, but there was, he, his job was also the chaplain because that was one of the, the posts underneath him that was unfilled. So he was doing it from the chaplain point of view, chaplain telling you to get an abortion. His name will come to me in a minute. Okay. But um, then I spoke to a woman named Kirsty Wilhair, who was like my senior senior. And I spoke to um, a girl who was a friend of mine and my husband's friend. And I spoke to a man named Jeff Porter, who's the chief of security international. I know, Jeff. Yeah, so do I. I know, Jeff. I have other things to say, but um, yeah, he was just like, you come back or you get declared. Kirsty was nice and saying, just come back, let's sort it out. Um, the other man whose name will come to me was the one who mentioned abortion. I said, don't ever mention it again. But my mother continuously mentioned it regularly. You should get an abortion. What am I going to tell Zoe? You should get an abortion. How are you going to raise the baby? You should get an abortion. You should get an abortion. You should get an abortion. Just repeatedly. How old was Zoe at that point? 13, probably 12 or 13. That was what got to me the most was the sister thing because I didn't know she didn't want to be there and I thought I had just ruined her entire life's plan and messed everything up for her. Because you two couldn't talk about this either. No. In fact, my mom never even told Zoe about it. Mm. Zoe found out about it because she saw a report that my, brother, that my husband had written on my dad, saying it was all my dad's fault. I'll go into that later, too. But that's how Zoe found out. No one ever told her. So that was what almost got to me. But I just kept saying to her, Mom, I can't live my life. You know, I've lived my life based off of what you want, and I'm finally doing what I want, I can't now change it because of what you're saying Zoe wants. I said, I feel very, very bad. I don't know what to say to her, but all I know is the most important thing is, you know, I have to do what I want to do, and this is what I want to do. And she just never got it. She never got it to this day that, you know, I'm mm -hmm. doing what I want to do. I said, I'll go back on April 1st. I'll be back on April 1st. And what I, I actually came back two weeks earlier I flew back and I stayed with my dad for a couple of weeks. I went and saw a doctor. I started getting everything under control. But uh, were you able to start getting sleep and eating? Yeah, because at my aunt's house, um, you know, she she got me some prenatal vitamins, some folic acid, which is important to take, all these things. I was able to start eating because part of the reason was I was very sick. And the other part of the reason was the food there is hard enough to eat when you're feeling well. When right. I was feeling nauseous, I could not stomach, you know, the food that they served. Right. Now I was eating actual regular food and I could stomach it. And my morning sickness went from being sick 10 times a day or more to once every couple days, you know, which is a bit more normal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I got a lot of rest and I, I, you know, I helped at their work for a couple hours a day and I talked with my aunt. My aunt's like a wonderful lady. And, um, you know, she was really helping me. I was saying, my mom's saying I should get abortion. What do you think you should, I should do? And she said, you should do whatever you want to do, you know. And my dad had said to me, I'll do, you do whatever you want to do, and I will support you, you know. He said, if you want to keep the baby, and he got in big trouble for this, just for saying, if you want to keep the baby, I will support you. You can come live with me. You can work for me. I'll help you. And, and um, he got in really big trouble. My mom screamed at him, you're a suppressive person. I'm going to get you declared all kinds of stuff so anyway so I ended up going back I ended up going back um, two weeks before I said I would they didn't know I was in LA because they'd come and get me I stayed with my dad I went and saw a doctor got everything even more under control and then I went back on April 1st and that was really hard to do yeah, I bet it, was. it was really 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 hard to do I was terrified um, but were you stronger feeling than you had been when you left? <laughs> yeah, but I was still terrified and I was dreading the next month or however long it was going to take. I was really, really dreading it. But I, 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 it was that or never see my family again. So I did it. I went back. But I said, I'm going to stay with my dad and every day I will come in and I will get a confession. I'll do everything you want, but I'm going to stay with my dad because I need proper food. I need a nice bed. I need all this stuff. You can't provide that for me. Because you are you were having to get a security check. Uh, yeah, the confessional. Every day. Yeah, yeah. So and what, what's the purpose of that when somebody's leaving? Why, why is that happening? Because 
Well, one of the reasons is L. Ron Hubbard says in a policy, the only reason that people want to leave is because they have overts and withholds. They have things they've done that are wrong that they're withholding. And if you get them to admit these things and handle them, they will... Um, they'll stop wanting to leave. Yeah, they'll stop wanting to leave. But at that point, I was pregnant. I was going to leave anyway. But so that at that point, it was more for a security purpose. They wanted to find out. Most of the questions they asked me were security related. You know, do you have any documents? Have you stolen anything? Have you, um, do you plan on going to a newspaper? Do you plan on um, affect, you know, speaking um, derogatorily about Scientology? You know, those were, those were the main questions. Mm -hmm. So, and then it was like, have you done anything um, wrong on the 2D, which means have you done anything like sexually bad, like had bad thoughts, you know, had sex with someone else? Mm -hmm. Nothing of which I'd done. But they, of course, are going to ask that because that's another thing they consider is a lot of the bad things you do are related to like, sexual things. So I said, I'm going to stay with my dad, and I'm going to do, um, I'll come in every day and do whatever you want me to do, but I'm going to stay with my dad. And they said, you can't. You have to, and I knew they'd say this, you have to stay um, in your, you know, they said, you can stay in your old room, but you have to stay there. And I said, well, what am I going to eat? You know, and they're like, oh, we'll work it out or whatever. So I was arguing with the security guard that I wanted to stay with my dad, and he finally said, uh, he was threatening me, and then he finally said, um, okay, this process is going to take three or four days. So if in three or four days you're not done, you can go back and stay with your dad. So I said, okay, write that down. So they had the security chief, Richard Metzler, write down, if you're not done, you know, you're going to be done with your process by this date. And if you're not, you can go back and stay with your dad while you finish it. So four days later, I don't even think they had started my confession. They may or may not have. That's another big thing is you have to have a confession before you leave. They have no one to do it. That's why people are there for six months to a year. But I yeah. knew they were going to rush mine a bit. They didn't want the staff seeing me getting more and more pregnant because right. it would give people ideas to get pregnant. You know, that, that's what's being done. And you weren't looking pregnant yet. I didn't look pregnant at all till after I left. You couldn't tell at all. No one knew, and, I, and everyone who, the few people who did know were told in no uncertain terms can they tell anybody else. So four days later, I said, okay, I'm going back to stay at my dad's house because I'm not done yet. And they said, if you do that, you will be put under non interpolation order, which means if you do one more thing that's, um, you know, that upsets somebody, for instance, saying, I'm going back to my dad's house, or anything, if you don't cooperate 100%, you will then be declared a suppressive person. So they might as well have said, if you go back to your dad's house, you'll be declared a suppressive person. Right. And I said, well, I have this note. The security chief wrote it. You know, I got it written down, because that's our big thing, get everything in writing. I have it written down um, that I can go back. And he said, well, you know, we just wrote that so that you'd stay, and you have no <laughs> choice but to stay. And if you go back, this is what's going to happen. Incredible. So I just thought, fine, I'll just stick it out and just get this over with, because I really had no choice at that point. So then I started going in for my confessionals, and I told you what the questions were already. It was like, you know, what have you done? And at that point, I still thought that the e-meter works, and if I didn't tell all, I was in big trouble, and they'd know. So I, of course, you know, told every thought I ever had, told all this stuff, you know, probably made up stuff to make it sound good, because if you don't make a lot, if you don't make it really sound like you've done something, then they're not going to believe you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Every day then in the evening at about 6 I'd say I'm leaving and I'd go back to the room and I'd have to eat like a microwaved meal. Like, you know, Stouffer's microwaved macaroni and cheese or something, which isn't what I wanted to eat at all. I was hard, having a hard time stomaching that. Then during the day, I was really tired. I was tired all the time. And during the day, I would have to come back in in the morning and they were supposed to set me up a bed that I could nap in while I was waiting because I'd have to wait hours for my confessional. But they never set it up. I had to sleep on the floor in like a little tiny office on the floor with a blanket every day while waiting. And then they were saying, what are you doing sleeping all the time? You should be doing your, your ethics handling, which means like reading policies on Scientology ethics, policy. Scientology policies on ethics and, you know, all kinds of stuff to, you know, to handle me so I'd be a better person. Well, to make you decide that you should stay. Yeah, and have an abortion, or if that didn't work, uh, you know, to stop me from doing anything against Scientology in the future. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was standing outside waiting for a ride back to where I was going to stay, and a staff member from the Religious Technology Center, which is like the very highest organization in Scientology, and these people like you're terrified of, everyone is, you have to call them sir, you can't do anything. If you like 
someone once tripped one of them or something and was... Um, you mean by accident? By accident, totally by accident, or bumped into them and he was like put on hard labor for, for accidentally tripping him. This is like how <laughs> scary these people are. He comes up to me and he says, what are you doing, Astra? And I said, well, sir, I'm pregnant and I'm leaving. And he said, are you getting a confessional? I said, yes. And I was, of course, not saying it like this. I said, yes, sir, you know. And he said, oh, no, actually, let me rephrase that. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm pregnant, so I'm leaving. And he says, oh, too late for an abortion? And I said, no. Unbelievable. So then he said, are you getting a confessional? I said, yes. Who was that? You know, I wish I could remember his name. He used to, he had a little sports car and he used to drive around and the license plate said Standard Tech, abbreviated on it. And he was very high up, very well known, but I forget his name. If someone told it to me, I would be able to say, yeah, that's his name. I knew he was scary. Yeah. He used to like scream at people, get in their face, spit on them, things like that. So I saw him do that and like, grab people. And so I was terrified of him that he said, oh, too late for an abortion. I was just like, I couldn't believe he even said that. Incredible. So then I, I continued getting my confessional. I finished that. I had to read some policies and I had to write what's called knowledge reports on people who I had thought done bad things. And then I had to sign an affidavit. Um, I knew I was going to have to sign that. That's another thing they have you do before you leave. And they write down all the bad things you've, you've said you've done. And then they make you write up all the wins you've had in Scientology, which you of course have to make sound great, because if you don't, you're back for more confessionals and you're not leaving till you sound like you love Scientology and you're leaving because you did bad things. So I wasn't wow. about to disagree with anything they said. I, I wrote up, in Scientology, you know, I've learned to communicate. When I came into the Sea Org, you know, I was very out ethics and they really helped me and if it wasn't for them, I don't know where I would have ended up. I just made it sound, I just, I knew what I had to say and I said it. And I also knew that whatever I signed was not legal because they said you can't leave unless you sign this. If you sign it, you're going to be declared a suppressed person. Your family will never see you again. If you don't sign it. If you don't sign it, so you better sign it before you leave. You have to. You have no choice. That's not legal because that's duress. So I kind of had an idea of that. Yeah. So I thought I'm just going to sign it. I just, and I wasn't planning on speaking out or anything. I still thought I want to be a Scientologist, etc. Even after all of this, you still wanted to be a Scientologist. Because you're so indoctrinated into the fact that it's your fault. Whatever happens, if you don't want to be there, it's your fault. You've done something out ethics. You're a bad person. You're irresponsible. You know you can't confront things. That I believe that. Mm -hmm but I also just physically and mentally couldn't take it anymore. So I was leaving thinking I was a horrible person. You just weren't good enough to be in the Yeah, sewer, I wasn't basically. good enough. I couldn't make it. I didn't have what it takes. Yeah, yeah so I would signed it and, um, and then I left. And they searched through my car and through my room to make sure I wasn't taking anything that belonged to them or that was any documents or anything like that. They had, when I was there, put together, put together my bill and given it to me. They give you a bill for Here's an example. I did like a computer course on how to learn to operate their computers. I did a course on how to do my job. They had a restructure of their management and I did several courses on, um, you know, they had written a bunch of new policies on their new management. I had done that. And then I had gotten sec checks, confessionals, hours and hours and hours and hours of them. I'd gotten them before because if you go on to high posts in like um, certain areas you have to get one before you go in so you can make sure you're qualified. I had done all of this. I had done, you know, a, just two or three things that were actual like Scientology spiritual things. I did the purification rundown and a couple courses. Um, the reason I'm saying that is the policy about freeloaders was written because apparently people used to go into the Sea Org just so they could get free service and then leave because you don't have to pay for it if you're on staff most of the time. So they wrote this policy that if you leave, you have to pay them back for everything. I mean, the whole thing's ridiculous, but I hadn't even done Scientology. I had just done, like, training. Yeah. So they give me my bill. It's $89,000. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and even I was in shock. I was like, I've only been here for four and a half years and I owe $89,000. But I thought, oh, I'm going to have to figure out how to pay. And I started, I was so scared that I'm going to have to pay this. I started working out a budget before I left. Okay, I'm going to work full time. I'll make $400 a week. I'll send them $100 every week. In 10 years, I'll have it paid off. Oh and hopefully gosh. before then, I'll get a better paying job. And I was writing it all down and trying to figure out how much stuff for the baby would cost so I could still send them like a quarter or a half of my money. And my mom had said to my dad, do you know what Astra's freeloader bill is? And he said, no. And she said, it's $89,000. But it's not your problem. She's going to have to pay it. So that's my mom's point of view. <laughs>